Thank you all for being here today. I want to take a quick moment to introduce our guest speaker today, Lopa Swami. Uh, Lopa Swami has been traveling for multiple decades around the US and around the world. And uh, he's been teaching the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita. And uh, today he's going to be talking about the art of meditation and overcoming negative emotions, which is something that we all experience uh, every day. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maharaj to explain this topic. Whoever figured out how to get this thing to work. Yesterday, I discussed some nice feedback. Very relevant. Stress management. Do you experience stress at university? Yeah. And that's one of the negative emotions. And then there's others. So this. Uh, presentation is part of a seminar that uh, was intended to help people because in general, a general topic is there's negative emotions that people deal with. There's professions that help people deal with negative emotions. This is just a simple rendering of that topic. Uh, it has a workshop aspect, so there's going to be some sessions where you can discuss. I'm, I'm going to ask you to discuss with others, and for application purposes. And uh, there's a several-part seminar. This is one of the parts. It's navigating through negative emotions for peace. So it's quite simple, and it's going to be quick. So here we go. Four keys. It's um, overcoming negative emotions through power of acceptance, power of goals, power of introspection, power of moving forward. So one by one, the power of acceptance one is longer. Uh, when there's negative emotions, there's a general response to people. Two categories, temporary insanity. And I hope the sound system works. This is a, a, a TV monitor uh, in a workplace. And this fellow is going to go mad because his computer isn't responding. And I hope you can hear the sound. Can't hear the sound. It's not working. And I can't click on my computer because that's not going to do anything. But it's going to click on it. There's. We're supposed to. I can tell you what it's. It's, it's not working. Um, the fellow. <coughs> you can hear the sound. So there's a surveillance camera going on in the workplace. His computer is responding. And so he starts hammering the keyboard and it's not responding. So the people in the workplace, they stand up because he's making a lot of noise. He gets out, walks out of the room. The surveillance camera shows he comes back in the room, literally with a sledgehammer, comes back in front of his computer and starts smashing and smashing and smashing and smashing and smashing. And this person, and then somebody over on this side, and they're standing up like, what happened to this guy? And he literally finishes both you know, the computer and the monitor. He goes mad. So that's, that's one possible response to a negative emotion. And there's another one that's the repression of negative emotion. And Repression of a negative emotion can lead to one feels depressed, or the flip side is one becomes a bully. You're feeling a negative emotion, so you take it on in other people. That happens sometimes. So, unrestricted negative emotions and repression is neither of them are recommended. It's, they're both bad choices. One of the negative ones is this one. This is self-sabotage. 
I know some people, maybe you know some people. If they don't have a problem, they create one. And then they start, it's like sawing up a limb and they wait till they hear the crack of the sound because the limb is breaking and then they scream. So repression, uh, and both taking it out on others and taking it out on yourself, it's not recommended. So then there's going to be a breakout session. Now isn't when that's gonna happen, but how should we process our emotions? So going down the, the path, the key of acceptance, sometimes unexpected things happen. This is a little story. A man checked with the weather forecast, sunny day, go for a walk on the boardwalk, sure enough it rained. Somebody was selling umbrellas, so he went for a walk on the boardwalk alone in the rain. So the plan that we have for the day or the semester or some period of time may go look like this. And sometimes something else happens unexpectedly. And it can be financial, in life relational, occupational, physical, social, etc. And when those challenges face you, sometimes it looks very formidable. It looks like you're gonna get whooped. There's the negative emotion, and there's the response of the negative emotion. It looks over, overbearing. And when it gets to that stage where it looks overbearing, negative emotions can be very disempowering. If you don't handle them properly or carefully. There are people that study this. Um, negative emotion is their career. Here's one lady, Dorothy Rowe. Depression is a prison where you are both the suffering prisoner and the cruel jailer. Now that's not a good direction to move in. You, you can set yourself free or you can stay locked up. It's a matter of knowing how to deal with the negative emotion when it arises. That's why the topic. So some tips. This is uh, the, the power of acceptance. Already, you know, denying is not healthy. Resentment towards the situation or the persons who are behind the situation. Feeling badly about oneself or resentment towards others. If you lock yourself in prison. So one of the things that people in this profession recommend is see that whatever the situation is and the emotion connected with the situation is temporary. Remember from yesterday, same idea. Sometimes life throws rocks at you and it hurts. Remember that? And so when you when you do that, then you have to you have a response. And there's different responses. The one that recommended here is it's temporary. Whatever it is, the rock, it's the emotion or the situation. And um, step back, see its temporality. Here's an example, common one. Romance is very attractive. And she says or he says, I can't live without you. Statistics says 18 months later, it flips. <laughs> Maybe you guys get married and you'll find out. <laughs> you get with somebody for some period of time, can't live with you. The, the romance is over and something else happens. That doesn't have to be looking like this, but it does change. So when you, the temporary distressful situation arises, it's like there's a big snowstorm. It wasn't as big as they said it was going to be. But when there's bad weather, and you're supposed to go to work, generally, people go to work despite the weather because there's something important for you to do. Similarly, we go on with our duties and serve despite the weather of the mind. Now remember that Viktor Frankl message, it parallels this one. Something that a 
a purpose that's awaiting you to be fulfilled, and you just continue with that purpose that's awaiting for you to be fulfilled, despite, despite the bad weather in the mind. As we tolerate environmental weather, we also, it's, it's recommended, tolerate the emotional weather. It's not a surprise that this is in Bhagavad Gita. One of the first lessons, some of you here not familiar with Bhagavad Gita, I make reference to Bhagavad Gita, it's like hieroglyphics or something. Do you know what Bhagavad Gita is? Have you heard of the title? Bhagavad Gita is a text that um, is a, it's a wisdom literature from ancient India describing the yoga system. That's one way of describing it. And so there, there are stages of yoga, and one of the first things in Bhagavad Gita when there's teaching is the teaching is um, the, the Sanskrit word is titiksha, is to tolerate. There's dualities in this world, happiness and distress, honor and dishonor, pleasure and pain, etc. Night and day, season, seasonal change. There's changes in this world of duality. So as it changes, the advice of Bhagavad Gita is recognize it's temporary and tolerate it. Tamitatiksha Svavarata in Sanskrit. Uh, just tolerate. So, you go on with the, the greater purpose while you tolerate or not become overwhelmed by the duality configuration at, at that particular time, because it's temporary. Here's uh, a text from Bhagavad Gita. The non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course, oh, this is the verse are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. Yeah, that's the verse. So that's the summer, that's the winter. And summer's nice, and winter's another kind of mess. Like cold weather. So with acceptance, supposing you had a plan. Your, your plan was you're going to do a, go on a, have a function. You're going to go on a picnic with some friends. And somehow you don't feel well. Because you've got the flu. So now what are you going to do? You can feel bad. You can make a neg negative emotion about, oh, the flu's on my way. Resentment of reality is more hurtful than reality itself. So if there's acceptance, you do what you need to do because of the reality of the situation. Reluctance to accept in itself causes negative emotions and even worse physical sickness. That the, the mental distress can lead to physical distress. We discussed that yesterday also. Sy sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system act even without our planning it. Some people come in our lives as blessings. Some come in your life as lessons. So both are good. Lessons are good. Blessings are good. If you only want blessings, you're, you're, you're living in the wrong planet because there's challenges in relations with, with people and circumstances and the world of duality. So with the ones that are the unpleasant kind, then there's some lessons to be learned, like the lesson of tolerance, the lesson of forgiveness, etc. The lesson of trying to make the world a better place by being a better person, being part of the world. Sometimes people say acceptance is disempowering. Cowardice, a weak response, resigning to fate, feeling defeated, or looking as if you're feeling defeated. However, those that are, that teach this process of dealing with negative emotions, 
It allows us to move forward rather than dwelling on past events. One of the things that's important in all of this is that your intelligence has the, the maximum capacity. When you feel a negative emotion, something happens to your intelligence, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Your discriminating power goes out the window and you become more reactive and dealing with a negative emotion that you may not have any capacity to deal with. The situation that was like the, the rock that threw the stone at you and left or that you got a flu or the, whatever the thing was. So it's not weakness, it's uh, actually empowering to go forward with the reality of duality and then see what path we can take that makes sense and continue moving forward. Nice example, Stephen Hawking. Hawking. Uh, he was born in, you know, in a different body than most of us have, and that's great misfortune. And he could have lamented over that or whatever, whatever. However, he accepted that, that was the circumstance of his life, and he used what he had, and he made some very significant contributions, at least in the academic field, and um, he's a hero for that acceptance principle. There's another from the Srimad Bhagavatam. The, the illustration down here is, this is a king who had something very unfortunate happen. He made a mistake, it was an intentional mistake, he got carried away, and he was cursed by a young Brahmin boy to die in seven days. Powerful little boy that had that mystic power so he just accepted. He turned his kingdom over to his eldest son. He went to the bank of the sacred river and he was preparing himself to meet death in seven days. And all these other people here, they're the sages in his kingdom who came to be present for his departure. And this young Sukadeva Goswami came and gave him transcendental instructions which for maybe 40 to 50 years I've been studying because it's very special. So it was a misfortune that turned into good fortune. And it turned into a good fortune by his accepting the, the circumstance and preparing himself for departure. When he was ready for departure at the end of that seven days, he was cured because he was filled with transcendental knowledge. There's, uh, not, it's supposed to go little by little, but it's not working. So I'll just, there, there's a, this came from a person I know uh, that teaches Bhagavad Gita, and he's been teaching it for 10 years, 12 years. And he came to the Potomac area, I'm Prusha, and this was the theme that he was doing and presented. So I got it from somebody from the Potomac, Maryland Center. So it's supposed to one by one show. When we don't accept an undesired event, it becomes anger. When we accept it, it becomes tolerance. That's this tolerate, duality. When we don't accept uncertainty, it becomes fear. When we accept it, it becomes adventure. I'm very familiar with this one. When we don't accept others' bad behavior towards us, it becomes hatred. When we accept it, it becomes forgiveness. When we don't accept others' success, it becomes jealousy. When we accept it, it becomes inspiration. And acceptance is the key to handling life well. So these lessons are lessons from wisdom literature, like Bhagavad Gita. And um, the final text of the final instruction in Bhagavad Gita is this one. Despite whatever the circumstances are, Krishna's advice is that we surrender. Now, uh, I don't know what to do when we come, there's some sound that's really important. Maybe I'll play it on my computer. 
No, no, it was not there yet. Part of it was just thinking out loud. So, what is success? So we're going to spend some. Ask you to spend some time in your little discussion groups with your three, four, two, three people, whatever you want to do. What is success in the worldly estimation? And by worldly estimation, are you successful? By worldly estimation, what's failure? And do to what degree do you consider yourself to be failure? So what is success? Oh, here, divided into two groups. One group discussed what is success in today's world? How many consider themselves successful? And how are we gonna do the two groups? Second group discussed what is failure? This is the worldly consideration of success failure. And how many consider themselves failures? A week ago, a week ago, I was at Northwestern University. And it was very interesting, a, a young student, South Korean background, <coughs> expressed that he sets really high standards for himself in many different categories and regularly doesn't meet them. And so to a degree, he's feeling, I'm not meeting my standards. And so he, to a degree, it's something he carries with him. And he's a bright young man, but he feels he's failing himself. That kind of thing, not like a social failure or something. So how do we do this? I mean, just, just because we're this side of the room, that side of the room, or the front of the room, the back of the room, Anybody want to say hi to us? We can do fives. Huh? We can do fives. Huh? Like that part of the side. Okay. Your group. <laughs> so you got to move your chairs and roll and sit together and then discuss. You're the, you know, what's, this, what's failure in modern society standards and to what degree do you feel that you, you fit that mold? Your group is with success by modern standards. Thank you, Thank you Tony. Failure could just mean being a bad person, like morally, like as simple as that. Because failure, I think there's a, there's something that an individual considers to be a failure, and there's something that you know society considers to be a complete failure. So, um, if society has some sort of a um, like a blueprint about how life should look like, so like you go to school and then you go to college and then you get a job. And then you make money, and you know that's that's success. And then the opposite of that, or a lack of that, is failure. And then to an individual, failure could be you know what they know that the society doesn't know about themselves. So like maybe they're having like like relationship issues or financial issues. So that could be a failure. Um, do you consider themselves a failure? I don't. I don't consider myself a failure because I'm happy, and I think um, that's like the highest measure of success. And, uh, but a lot of people do think they're a failure because they're holding themselves up to some standard that they didn't set, somebody else set it for them. And it's, you know, it's always like, you know, if you're reaching for it, it goes higher, you're reaching for it, it goes yeah. higher. So, okay. Let me go or? <laughs> I have so much ID because, you know, like, uh, some, well, maybe when I'm young, when I was young, I said, like, okay, what is success like more like for me like whatever like i pay this or that i get success i get some prize or success but when you grow older and you're in the university and try to get a job and 
and everybody, your family, your friends, you know, said this was what is the success of me, you need to earn money, you know, in your career, you need to be in the top position. Um, individually, then, you know, sometimes we get lost in this, like, what I really want to do, but that, for example, if I like to dance, but you don't earn much money in dance, success is like, you work in a corporate world and you earn like money. And then start looking into that. Um, um, and that's the point where people reach into, you know, like failures, they start comparing, but their mind is into something else. Um, do I consider myself as a failure? Uh, no, because I think I'm still in the process of learning. Um, and, I, and I try to learn every day, so I don't think I'm, I'm a failure. <laughs> So yeah, what is success and what is failure totally depends on people. It depends on the person whom you are talking to. Mm -hmm. So in today's society, the society believes that a person is successful if he is in a very good college or after that if he is in a very good company making something like one million dollar or two million dollar. Also after that, like is happy with his family, kids, kids are going to good school. All those things, yeah, if it is there, then they consider that the person is successful. If that is not the case, then yeah, they consider him to be a failure. Yeah. And uh, if you ask me, am I a failure or a successful person? I would tell that I'm a partial, partially failure. <laughs> I'm not successful or I'm not a failure. Like, like, although certain, I have certain passion, but in today's society, like, people wanted you to be different. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, so I'm not. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely agree with everyone. Um, yeah, failure is very, it depends a lot on the person and who you ask. Um, I don't consider myself a failure just because for me, failure would be a, not being happy with the decision to make. And I don't know, I feel like I'm going towards what I want it to be in my life. So, I'm just thinking about our self-realization mm -hmm. here yeah. to motivate myself if I'm failure mm -hmm. in order to get successful. Mm -hmm. This is the way I'm following. Mm -hmm. I thought somebody was trying to hit hearing well, so I'll skip that part. But uh, there were times where I thought I was a failure in the past, but like moving forward now, I like, look at those, look at those failures and like, just steps to succeeding. Uh, or maybe what I thought was a failure at the time but end up being it's too high. Yeah. 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 Your life is better because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Or failure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I don't consider myself a failure. I think Yeah, I think a lot of um, you know, a sense of failure comes because there's so many unrealistic expectations. Like they want you to like, like you gotta be good at this and that and that and everything. It's just like you, they just sort of like fail to like take into account that you're human and you know you have 24 hours a day, and what's important to you goes out the window, and you're like, okay, let me do what's gonna make them happy so that in the world I'm successful. And to myself, I have like a dozen health problems and I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't do anything properly because I'm so busy helping people be happy with who I am, even though I'm not happy with who I am. So I think, yeah, in that case, like a lot of us could be failures because, I mean, nobody's pleasing everybody. I mean, everybody has problems with somebody, right? So in that case, all of us are failures. But then if we actually look at it, like, you know, I'm, I'm successful if I'm happy. And I'm successful if I'm doing what I want to do. So in that case, we're all successful. So some of us. Oh, 
Let's move into because the topic is overcoming negative emotions. You know, the, the response to this, this group's summary, what you said with the summary, is even for our own subjective, it can kind of work, move, and sometimes and sometimes. And then, then there's the emotion that says, yay. And then there's the other emotion that says, oh, let's do a little this and okay. Deep breath, we did that. Looking back at history, previous century, failures were seen as bumps in the road. Modern times, failures seen at the end of the road persons are labeled. There's a, a few people I know in government positions that I, I call these little failures. And you know that's that's their own way of asserting themselves, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But dealing with that which doesn't go well or what might be called failures is um, culturally today it's much stronger. Now this was borrowed from a China website, so it has both English and Chinese, but the social expectation, it was mentioned. And support your parents, have high income, have children, own property, buy a car, and lots and lots and lots of social pressure all around the world, not only here. And um, Sometimes we're living the expectations of others instead of our own real higher purpose of life. Social pressures and social status which form conceptions around success and failure. That's 
inhibit the ability to be open to accept our life condition and our emotions to our system. Here's some texts from the Vedas. They're supposed to show one by one, but it's not doing it. This is um, a text where Brahma is offering a, a prayer to Krishna. He did a bobo, and he knows he's going to get some reaction for his bobo. One who earnestly awaits you to bestow your causeless mercy upon him all the while, patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds, and offering you respectful obeisances with his heart, words, and body, is surely eligible for liberation, for this becomes rightful claim. And somehow this ran right off the screen. So the idea that's out of this that slide is this. When misfortune comes because of some misdeed and it's deserving to come to us, just accept it and, and look to the Supreme always for kindness and mercy because Supreme Krishna is kind and merciful. Now this is another Bhagavad Gita verse. A pure devotee is never disturbed in any circumstances, nor is he envious of anyone, nor does a devotee become his enemy's enemy. He thinks, this person is acting as my enemy due to my own past misdeeds, so it's better to suffer than to protest. Is not shown. Shakespeare said the same thing in Hamlet. Maybe some of you know. Anybody know Shakespeare? Whether it's better to suffer the slings and arrows of misfortune, Hamlet's kind of soliloquy. So, what, what's, what's the better path? In Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna is saying is misfortune comes. It has something to do with this back there, the karma thing, and here it comes. And so rather than protest the misfortune or the instrument of the misfortune or something, there's this advocacy is to accept and then stay in your position of who you really are long-term as just the eternal soul. That's the Bhagavad Gita message. Okay, that's, it, that's the acceptance when I said that for longer number three, and our goals. We, we mentioned yesterday, I, I really like um, Victor Frankl and his teaching, Man's Search for Meaning. So it, it connects very much with that. When there's a negative emotion or a, or a positive emotion, right-size it. Without a clear purpose or goal, our emotions tend to grow larger than they need to be. So this is the purpose or goal. Remember that example. He was in a concentration camp. And every day, the guards would come by and rattle the chain. Here's a little story. And then they go to the next cage, the next cage, and then they, they had the lock, they unlock the lock hold the chain, make a lot of noise. And then they would grab the person inside that little box and drag them up to the gas chamber. And they, were, they would scream. And the people inside their little box, they would hear the scream. It was like, it was terror. So one day it was his turn. They pulled, they rattled the chain, unlocked the lock, pulled the chain through the, the, the hasp, and then grabbed him and were taking him off to the gas chamber. He didn't scream, he didn't panic. In his own words, providence saved him. Because what happened was there was some noise off in the distance. The guards just left him standing in the middle of the field, take care of whatever that was. By the time it was done, they came back and put him in the little cage. So he was, because his meditation was that I have a I have a purpose to fulfill. 
and um, it was there was intervention because he had fixed on that purpose and he didn't panic when it came to the great misfortune. So emotions tend to grow larger than they need to be when we don't have a clear purpose or goal. Saying in the perspective of our life's goal, how important is this particular event, blip in the screen usually, or internal motion that is triggering us? I'm gonna ask you in a, in a short moment to take some time and for your own purpose, like what is your goal, your life mission? You got to give you 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a photograph of somebody that's on a highway. Now supposing they're somebody in their car, they're having a medical emergency and they're going as quickly as they can to the nearest hospital. And while they're going as quickly as they can to the nearest hospital, a car cuts them off. You know, squeezes in the middle of the traffic. If the person is fixed on, I gotta get this person to the hospital, that takes precedent over any other emotion because it's so important. So um, when you have important business to take care of, other things that happen are much less registering as consequential because you have a higher mission. An example is sometimes given of a river. Uh, as we were driving, coming down whatever that road is and on the, on the west side of the lake, there's all these streams flowing with this good time of year and snow is melting. As, as this, and, and sometimes it's just this little trickle and then all of a sudden there's this big ravine on the other side of the road. So when rivers flow and flow and flow, there may be obstacles in the way, but they keep flowing and slowly the obstacles where the smaller stones and pebbles get tossed into the sea and the other stones get worn and worn and worn. So just like a river flowing to the sea, when there's a purpose of life, that's this power and goal, then obstacles, you need obstacles, that, that happens. There's a nice message found again in Srimad Bhagavatam, it's a wonderful text. This is a, a painting of Queen Kunti. Uh, you don't know Bhagavad Gita, but the, the, the main person who was receiving the message of Bhagavad Gita was a great warrior. His name was Arjuna. And in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, he asks his friend Arjuna, his friend Krishna, to draw his, the chariot in between the two armies and he sees one flying duck and says, I can't do this, I'm out of here. He gives ethical reasons why he can't go forward. So then in his dilemma, what to do, what to do, he asks, what should I do, what's my duty? And then Bhagavad Gita spoke. So Arjuna's mother was Kunti and Kunti had five sons, Arjuna was one of those five sons. And they were put into difficulty after difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. She's saying goodbye to Krishna because he's going back to his capital city, saying, if misfortune comes, that's just fine because my mind will then go to you when there's misfortune, like the Ganga, like the river Ganges flows downstream let my mind just always flow towards you, difficulty or no difficulty. And the tendency to think of higher purposes may come, doesn't always happen that way. When there's some misfortune or some hardship, you think of some higher purpose. So this is the 30 second exercise. I'll give you two minutes. On your handheld device, your phone or whatever it is, Everyone has one or two. So write down something that what you'd like to accomplish. That's the common rule.
another minute and I see heads comes up and means I'm ready to move on. Somewhere just around it, so move it. Mm -hmm. I'm going, to, I'm going to share something about a little more than a week ago I was invited to a Zoom call with some people that I never met before there were, there were Tamil speaking, speaking people from South India and there was a translator most of the people could speak English anyway but there was a translator for those that couldn't and one of the ladies my guess was she's around 50, she's a medical doctor. And um, she said, at this, at this stage in my life, I'm very clear what my prescribed duty is. It's, it's Sanskrit swadharma, my duty in life is medicine, and I'm trained. However, very recently I came across this translation of Bhagavad Gita. I don't think any of you guys are not familiar with it. So, but she knows what her she wants to accomplish, but she, now she has another layer. She said, I, 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 I appreciate my life is not complete without uh, a sense of a spiritual connection along with my professional life. So how do I go about it? because my life is full. I don't have much. I was a medical doctor. I don't have much time. And you know, many of you, <clears throat> I'm aware, at Cornell University, you have lots of academic pressure, which is nice. I mean, it's, it's, it's encouraging to have be held accountable to, to perform those things. So where is there time for the spiritual core, the spiritual dimension? You're here because there's some idea that that's important. So I thank you for being here, but you know, supposing you're 50 years old, and if, if the accomplishment is simply a career goal, at least this nice lady that's still with me, it's, it's not sufficient. Now how do I go about it? Especially because my life is really busy. My life is really busy. So we, we spoke about time management and so forth, similar to yesterday. But my recommendation is when you contemplate what you'd like to accomplish, please make sure that there's a spiritual dimension to that. And if you're gonna have a purpose that you want to accomplish, you have to invest some time and energy, but it's not gonna happen on its own. And there's very simple methods. Bhagavad Gita will help you. So expectation management. Suppose you had a nice plan, and it looked like this. There's this place, starting point, and there's a finish line. But generally, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> there's the unexpected, just like you know the man walking on the boardwalk. And then there's this obstacle. Yeah, there's sunshine at the end, but there's a lot of. Uh, discrepancies in between. So when those things happen, this is a, a nice diagram I like. This is a, a microscopic picture of tapestry or embroidery. And when you look at it, it's kind of like chaotic. But when you step back, then there's a pattern. And so life is a little chaotic sometimes. But if you are a little patient, Sometimes you can be patient. There's a purpose or a plan for what seems to be chaotic as you're passing through it. So it's helpful to have a big picture. That's it for the for the power of goals. These are a little shorter, power of introspection. Now this introspection is a nice word. From from the context of Bhagavad Gita it means mode of goodness means rather than reacting to 
at the situations you go through, reflect it, and look within yourself. It's something like Mother Teresa said, some persons come as blessings and some persons come as lessons. It takes introspection to be able to see that. So there's a lot of attention to become controllers of things. And that's our culture, fix things, they don't work rather than accept or tolerate. Divorce, if there's disharmony, if there's a off-season months, you import things, it goes on and on. Instant communication options to fix loneliness. Does that fix loneliness or does it foster loneliness? It's kind of the same, it fosters loneliness. It becomes an addiction, but it doesn't fix loneliness. Comforts, air conditioning and heating, TV, only for electric stuff. What? What does the body do? I travel a lot, maybe more than a smart person would do. And <laughs> what people do on planes is very shocking. And it's just like well dressed people, seemingly well put together people. Some people do normal things. But many, I would say 80%, are, they've got something or two something growing. They're playing cards or they're playing with those little, I don't know what they are, little things move around and they move those things around and they can do it for hours. It's just brain trauma. It's, it's a, I, okay, so. Scientific and technological improvements have increased our conviction of being able to control our lives and destiny. However, it's not like that. The reality is when something is moving, how do you get it to stop? We're subordinate to laws much greater than us. And that's always the case. Health, accidents, career, wars, so we're in a place that has a grip on us, so how do we get, what do we do about that? How can we control? The one thing that can control is uh, the, just like Victor Frankl. <laughs> if you weren't there yesterday, it's a good one to go see again. Be making your choices, but where you direct your consciousness is something you can't control. And there's disciplines and there's, besides techniques, there's, there's a science. Bhagavad Gita has that science, for example. Last, power moving forward. And here we go, there's some more up there. Associate with positive people. This is less in the Bhagavad Gita. It says, Sangat Sanjayate Kama. According to the association you keep, you develop tendencies or desires. So keep good association and your tendencies will be stronger. And let's see if this works because there's, a, there's two little videos and it's basically showing, it's meant to show, work together. And um, uh, oh, there it is. Okay, so the sound isn't working on this machine, but it's working on mine. So let's see if we can get it going. <laughs> So it's showing a, a firefly and he's got his light on the rear end and he is flying along and he bumps into a tree and he falls down and the light kind of goes like this. 
and he turns around, there's a whole bunch of fireflies traveling together. There's so much light because they're traveling together, they don't bump into a tree. So he looks, he wants to follow them. He gets up and then bumps into a tree and falls to the ground again. That's that one. It, it's, it's, it's in Dutch, they're, pr they're promoting public transportation. <laughs> it's a little cartoon to promote public transportation. And then this one is a bunch of ants, and the, the, the music is nice, but they're walking along one by one by one by one, and there's a guy who's kind of directing everybody. And then over on this side, you see an ant, he's, a, he's starting to suck in, and one of the ants is being pulled by the anteater, and he holds on to something, and they all get together, and they form this big group of ants, and he gets stuck in the anteater's nozzle, and he falls to the ground. Good boy. <laughs> it's cute. Make sure they can't see it. <coughs> nice. So that with with good association, there's strength. Bad association, it's it's a little harmful. But good association, there's strength. So keep good association. This is some advice. Problems get bigger and bigger if you just think about them. Think about them. So instead. Um, then give your attention to where you want to go. Not just to problem and problem solving. A lot of time, conventionally, we spend in problem solving and, and make the problem seem bigger than it really is. There's this cute little saying that where attention goes, energy flows. So if you give your attention to the problem, it seems to magnify. But if you give your attention to where you want to go, then your intelligence is working differently. So don't keep feeding the negative energy because it simply grows. Rather, take small steps every day in the direction that you want to go. I was kind of coaching somebody that they have a tendency to like do too much. This was an actually a student at Northwestern. Try, they have a tendency to set goals for themselves that aren't real, realistic, and they feel disappointed that they didn't meet those goals for themselves. So be clear what your goal is, but take small steps every day. Incremental steps, trust yourself and to trust others. Incremental steps in doing something positive for yourself. Incremental steps in applying mantra meditation. So this, this connects with the yesterday topic of the importance of meditation or mantra meditation in um, keeping everything in balance. Don't make promises to improve that you can't keep. It only exacerbates feelings of failure. That was this student at Northwestern feeling I'm a failure person who has unrealistic many branch different goals for himself. Reading of wisdom literature is very helpful. And last slide. Think about all the care and elements of joy in your life. Write a personal letter to Krishna or your the source of all things to you, thanking him or her for those wonderful things. Think about the sun, beautiful nature, your breath, digest your system etc. The gifts that have been given to you. You probably know people, <coughs> I know some people, they're really fantastic people, and they struggle. One person is amazingly supporting, but they have low self-esteem, and no matter what, they accomplish just not enough. They really struggle. They're just good persons. They, 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 they need support that something that didn't happen in during a certain stage of their life to work on real quick. And they just carry it. No matter what they do, it's not enough. And they feel that way. So counting blessings is, is a nice reference in that.
chanting. This, this is a, an illustration showing that mantra, sound vibration, cleanses the mirror of the heart. And so that which we, the real happiness that's within becomes restored, intellectually speaking. And there's my spiritual master, Founder Chai, who rescued me when I was in college. So let's see if there's some comments. At least we got the projector to do something. We didn't do the whole thing. If you get this room again, you probably should find out from the technology guy Kevin. There's probably a button somewhere. Anything from what you can just stay with you? Yeah. because of the smell, but uh, it's not too pleasant. Um, so I was wondering if there's any recording or playing backgrounds. Stress management, it was, I went fast because of a lot of this material, but it's very practical. Yeah. Especially here in LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really high pressure. Yes? Uh, could you describe that anecdote of being on the plane and traveling a lot and seeing people often, I think, essentially respond to the negative emotion of boredom with cheap yeah. stimulation yeah. in various ways and numb their minds yeah. in various ways? Um, are there specific prescriptions in the Bhagavad Gita for how to respond to this negative emotion of boredom? Negative emotion of boredom? Yeah. Well, not specific to boredom. But two things. Um, when, when there's a satisfaction, with, it's chapter six of Bhagavad Gita. When, when there's satisfaction within, there isn't boredom. It didn't say what, you know, of different varieties of negative emotions, when it was, was dissipated. But when there's light, darkness is dissipated. And the, the light is, a sense of satisfaction within. Largely, people are being disconnected with who they really are, meaning the, the soul. They're looking for happiness because we all want happiness because that's what souls by nature are. They're looking for it out there and it's not there. Try it this way, that way. So then people, passion is kind of the way. It's one of the ignorance is the boredom. Those are two of the key modes, if you remember from yesterday. So the happiness within is the mode of goodness. That's who we are. And you're feeling that happiness is the antidote for both. The excess is this way or that way. Happiness within. And happiness within is who we are. So that sounds pretty simple. Then how do you get to who you are? Then there's that the system of yoga, the different kinds of yoga, karma yoga, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then it, it ways of connecting with, disconnecting with who you are, so that you can connect with who you are. The problem is, we're, we're covered with ignorance. We're ignoring who we are. Or we're looking for who we are, or the happiness, somewhere out there instead of who we are. So this way of connecting with who you are by dialing down the misconception. So is there any specific picture to you of what someone on the plane would look like if they had achieved this sort of enlightened state of disconnecting from yeah. ignorant, yeah. Uh, inauthentic? The, the answer the answer is spiritual sound. So they either they vibrate it, sometimes I do that, 
feel something and that disturbing the person that was me. But mantra meditation or softly chanting so I can hear. And if there's the sound vibration or hear recording with you know with earplugs and not disturbing people. And you're hearing spiritual sounds. Or reading a book. A lot of what I do when I'm traveling when I'm preparing for saying six sets. I'm preparing that you know that my thoughts and focusing on you know what's inside and how to bring what's inside outside, etc. So by by spiritual sounds, whether it's recorded or audible or meditation on that sound, you don't even have to make the sound. Sound. Because sound is the primary element, spiritual sound is the primary element that awakens who we really are. So it connects with sounds one one or another. And that's what people do that are that are not caught up in that numbness for them. So something you need that. You give them something you need that. You're energized. Because passion, if it's not spiritual, then it's just it's the tabas, then it fades. It can go on for you know, a long time, but it, it, it's temporary, because by nature, material things are temporary. So there's nothing, being, being, being an, a, a capable intellectual, enough that you're a Cornell University student, use it in your career and Use it in, in speaking to you know the students in general, in the military and elsewhere. Use it in contemplating that life's higher purpose and connecting with that higher purpose while you're doing the career part or the you know the worldly intellectual part. While you're doing that, simultaneously the inward cultivation. It takes thoughtfulness. It takes intelligence. It's the, the discriminating capacity is what the intelligence does. You just can you can discriminate this from that. So you spend time over here, a long time over here. When you spend time over here, it spiritualizes the time spent over there. It makes it more effective too. On the way over here, we had a car ride from Rochester. The other day was an hour and a few down here. So I was thinking, I'd like to make, maybe next time I come, we'll see. Well, she's, she's the quality control person. But I'm thinking of, you know, sound, the power of sound. And there's material sound and its power, and then there's spiritual sound and its power. So I, what is it? What is it about it? So sounds are very powerful. Even material sounds are very powerful. They make weapons of sound now. And etc. 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 Sound moves matter. I can give some examples. But spiritual sound not only moves matter, but it moves that which moves matter. Spiritual sound resonates with the, the life force within, the soul, not the mind, but the soul, spiritual sound resonates with the soul. And when the soul becomes resonated or vibrated or activated, then the mind and the body also become similarly resonated and activated. of, you know, this thing, th th there's, pardon me, but you asked, I'm going to ask, answer. There's the instrument, there's the power of hearing, and there's the soul. The instrument can break and you can replace the instrument, but the power of hearing is subtler than the instrument of hearing. 
So we used the power of hearing along with the instrument for hearing. Supposing someone's deaf, or supposing there's a child in the womb and they're hearing spiritual sound, but they, it doesn't register like it's registering right now. But it's still acting because there's sound that's acting on, that's being heard by the, the power of hearing. And then if it's spiritual sound, it resonates with the soul. And so, yes, you can hear, but it's, you can't necessarily distinguish, ah, that's a spiritual sound. Oh, that's a material sound. Because to the material ear, they may sound the same, but they act differently. And the, 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 the subjective experience of how they act differently is something that someone can experience. An RIP, someone was saying like this. In their own words, they said, I find there's something very special about this mantra. Because I, you know, I'm a musical kid, I da da But there's something special about this sound. Can you tell me what's, what it is, what's with this sound? Because it's acting on the soul and he feels it. Now, he's a little subtle person. Not everyone's going to detect it. Your question was, can we hearers detect it? And my answer is they can hear the sound, but not necessarily is it going to register with the, the, with the intelligence, the shamedi faculty. This is spiritual sound. And that's not spiritual sound. Rather, if, if one becomes two things, if one becomes more purified, that, that can be detected. And the other is, through, through wisdom literature, through knowledge, that's the sending kind of knowledge, not the ascending kind of knowledge, then you can know, even if you're not so subtle. Through the, the authority of wisdom literature, this authority of scripture, you can know what's what. But subjectively, it can be verified through practical experience. I'll give a little example, my personal example. A few years ago, 50 years ago, I was, I was in college. And I started doing, I started searching. I was prompted, I won't go through it, but I was prompted because of the Vietnamese War. <coughs> and I was of the age that the American government decided they wanted me to go to, to Vietnam and be some part of this with the war. And, and so they sent draft notices. So, because it was a stupid war, and you take somebody out of medical school to go through a stupid war, it's double stupid, so I'm not going to respond. My parents said, you got to respond, they put you in jail. And I failed to respond. And then, so eventually I said, okay, I'm going to have to do something. I was told you can go to the draft board, get a conscientious objector form, and fill it out, and if, if you get an A in your exam, then you'll have to get A's and Zens, then you'll you get exempted, from, you have your status changed. So I, start, I got the, the form, and state the nature of your belief, first question, such that you cannot take part in the armed forces of the United States of America. It was okay, I know how to get A's in the exam, but the pen wouldn't move, because I didn't know what my beliefs were. I mean, I knew how to get A's in exams, but I didn't know what my beliefs were. There's a difference. So that took me out. I said, what the heck is going on here? So I, I, da, 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 da. I had success in all the way you're supposed to be a success. I know where my convictions are. Something's wrong. I'm doing a timeout. So I did a timeout and started searching and da 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 da. And one of the things was sound. I, I was I was every day I was chanting five different mantras. Because I found sound was powerful. And one of them was especially powerful. So I did more of that. And then somebody said, just I felt it. Somebody said, 
good, you're, you're spending this much time, you spend that much time. I'm busy. But okay, I'll try. So I, I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna try. I found, subjectively, that by chanting for two hours, it only was taking me half an hour to do what I was doing. I became so energized that my sleep reduced by two hours. I didn't try for that, but I felt so energized that my sleep reduced. And not only my sleep reduced, then I did my academic work, and I did it in less time than it took me to do what I was before. And now I had extra time because my academic work took, it took less. I could read Bhagavad Gita. But that's, it, that's me. It's not everybody that the same thing is going to happen. But it had an effect. Energizing, spiritualizing effect. And I started to see the world a little differently than before. So there's something changed inside. But that was my experience, and someone else is going to read it. You know, everyone's experience is going to be different, right? What's with this sound? So I, I'm thinking I'll uh, go through a, a little presentation. You know who Banda Swami is, right? So he did, he, he's like a, a brilliant young man. And uh, he did a presentation on the power of sound. And he sent me his presentation. I, I, I didn't want to change the thing. So it's really good. Look at what, what the universal is. Sound. Unless you wish you had a book, you don't have to come to the university. Do something about it. Uh, would you mind if I ask, uh, what's your maybe top three favorite mantra? What's my favorite what? Like mantra. My favorite one? Shh. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe top three. Okay. <laughs> But what um, those five were? Huh? You mentioned five mantras. Yeah, you want to know which ones were? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a popular one that I'm not sure I, I pronounce it correctly, but Nam Yo Hanende Kyo. That was one. <laughs> You've heard that one before? That's another one. Anyway. The, the Maha Mantra is the one that I ha have been for some number of years chanting every day. Maha Mantra? Maha. That's my name. <laughs> Mantra. <coughs> Maha Mantra. It's Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. She'll provide you with a, a copy. She'll send you a copy. I think I've been chanting it wrong every day. <laughs> This side of the room, something staring all the way. Okay, so let's move on to the beginning then. I brought with me to up, uh, my upstate New York visit some um, something that's been offered to Krishna. Thank you. 